probably one of my favorite studies. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. And this can be one of the most intimidating studies to teach yeah. if you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> That's the case with all the studies, amen? But the coming of the kingdom, you have to really know your stuff to be able to teach it effectively. And that's the goal. We want to remember the purposes of the first principles, which is, what's the first purpose? Solidify. Solidify. What's the second? Unify. To unify. And what's the third? Multiply. Multiply. Amen. So the first study that we start off with, if they have no faith, or low faith, or not really sure what they believe, is... John. John. The book of John. And now we can take them through the Jesus Study Series as well. And then if they have a faith in Jesus, which study do you start with? Seeking God. Yeah. Seeking God study. Now, the whole purpose of the First Principles study series is to build a foundation of faith. So the Seeking God study builds a foundation that helps you get ready for the Word of God study. They're designed to be put in a specific order for a specific reason. Seeking God, I'm ready to seek after God with my whole heart. Now, if I'm going to seek after God with my whole heart, then i got to learn what God wants. And what God wants is outlined right in the Word of God. And if I'm going to do what God wants, I can't go by what I want or what I feel. I have to go by God's Word. So the Seeking God study gets our hearts ready to seek God. The Word of God helps us realize it has to be by His standard. Then the Discipleship study helps us understand what's it really mean to be a Christian. What does it mean to become a follower of Jesus? And we have to live it out. And of course, the persecution study that we do helps us understand that, hey, this is going to be exciting, but you got to put on your armor because the devil is going to come after you if you want to truly be a disciple. So this study is actually very quite simple. It's very, it's very simple. We actually are able to go through this and find out, according to the Bible... How does someone really become a Christian? We look in discipleship, what does it look like as a Christian? But the coming of the kingdom study gives us our first glimpse into how do people go from not being Christians to actually being Christians. And so it's like going on a journey. You know how through the Seeking God study you, you ask somebody, what do you think this means? How does this apply to you? Through the scriptures we read right here, they're not as much personal application as much as you're trying to put a bunch of puzzle pieces together to form a big picture. Now, when you go into the study, you want to have that big picture in your mind and be excited about it. Otherwise, it's just going to come across as like a bunch of information that doesn't really make sense. And then at the end, you challenge them and they didn't understand it and it's not going to really connect with their hearts properly. So what we're going to do is going through this study, we see the continuity of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Because one of our core convictions as a church is that we are a Bible church, not simply the New Testament church. Mm -hmm. So the Word of God works together. Now when I do this study with someone, I let them know that it's a little bit different, and it's going to be a lot more scriptures, so just try to keep in mind. And the whole if they have a lot of questions throughout, I always try to steer them back to the Bible study and say, look, Here's, this study is going to answer a lot of the questions. If by the end of the study you still have a lot of the same questions, then let's talk about them. But try to see it like a puzzle piece that's getting put together and try to find out. Now, the question that I start off with is, what is the kingdom of God? I say, we're doing a Bible study on the coming of God's kingdom. So what is it? A lot of people say something along the lines of, uh, well, I think it's God's dominion. It's like, what does that even mean? Okay, God is in charge of everything, so everything is His kingdom? Well, how do I become part of God's kingdom? When did God's kingdom come? Is it here yet? I think that's a good question to ask somebody. What is God's kingdom? When did the kingdom come? And they're like, hmm, I'm not really sure. Say, well, is it here yet? Do you think it's here yet? Well, yes or no. You get all sorts of answers here, but the goal is to set up the study Say, by the end of this Bible study, all these questions, how does somebody become part of God's kingdom? What is it to be in God's kingdom? What is God's kingdom? That gets answered by the end of the study. So you have to prepare their hearts to be excited to learn about what these answers are. So we start. Now it's important when you look at the coming of the kingdom study, just like with the scripture that uh, Brandon shared tonight, there's all sorts of scriptures that point to 
this teaching in the Word of God, which is pretty awesome. So we want to paint the picture, starting with the Old Testament predictions of the kingdom. We're going to start in the Old Testament and see some Old Testament predictions of what God's kingdom is about. And then we're going to end with the New Testament predictions and see how all of this came together and what happened. So let's turn to Isaiah chapter 2. Now, before you jump into Isaiah chapter 2, you ask, do you know who King David was? Some people have no idea. They're not really aware. Some people know about King David, but all you really need to know is that King David was a super awesome king. And all of Israel looked up to King David. When, when Israel was doing great, King David was king. And that was around 1000 BC. Now it's important to remember these dates because you want to start setting the timeline for when does all this stuff happen. And if you don't really know and you just throw a bunch of scriptures at people, it's going to make them more confused about how that all fits together. So 1000 BC, King David was king approximately, and it was the height of Israel's glory. The, the kingdom of Israel. Now, in Isaiah chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 1, and we realize this is 750 B.C., so a couple hundred years after King David, Isaiah prophesied what we're about to read here in Isaiah 2, verse 1. It says, This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established. As the highest of the mountains, it will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways, so that we may walk in His paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations, and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor... Will they train for war anymore? So what we set this up by saying is that this was prophesied about 750 years before Jesus even came. A couple hundred years afterwards. And there's four distinct points we want to make from this key characteristics of the scripture. Because we don't want to go into a super in-depth explanation of every single word from this. But we want to help people realize, okay, there's four things here to keep in mind that we're going to see, because I, I explained, Isaiah was a prophet, right? Mm -hmm. He was a prophet, so what did he do? He prophesied. Mm -hmm. So when prophets prophesy, they speak God's word, and if it says something's going to happen, then something in the future, the Jews believe it would happen, mm -hmm. right? So, so remember that, and the first thing it says is, in the last days. Now the last days, we're going to use that terminology later on, as we see the end of this study, how it gets fulfilled, but it's not talking about the, the, the apocalyptic last days. That's not what it's talking about. In fact, it's most likely that it's in the last days of the Jewish temple worship because God's temple, the, the temple, was destroyed around 70 AD. So it was around this time, in the last days, God's going to do this thing. Well, what's he going to do? He's going to establish the Lord's temple, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as highest above all the mountains. So that's another word, the mountain. It symbolizes God's kingdom. Now you don't have to go into super deep explanation, just say the mountain symbolizes kingdoms. It's going to be a kingdom or a mountain above all the other mountains. And it's going to be exalted, so all nations are going to stream up to it. That's another key point right there, all nations are going to stream to it. So everyone is going to pretty much know about what this kingdom is. And it says in verse 3, He will teach us His ways so that we may walk in His paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord, from Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is going to be a central location that God's kingdom or God's mountain is going to get established right there. <clears throat> You guys with me? Yes. Yeah. So you just want to explain that, and if they have a ton of questions, try to say, well, just keep in mind that this was a prophecy. Let's see how some of this comes to, to fruition later on. So you fast forward about 200 years to Daniel chapter 2, and Daniel, as we know from the scriptures, was an exile under Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king. And as Daniel was an exile, 
Nebuchadnezzar, you want to set up this passage by explaining it. You don't need to read all of chapter 2 to explain this whole thing. But you need to be familiar with what's going on in this chapter. So if you're not sure when you go to explain it, you need to be a Berean yourself and make sure that you've read through all of Daniel 1, Daniel 2, Daniel 3, just kind of see the context of what's going on there. But you'll find that Daniel interprets a dream for King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar had all of his wise men, astrologers and whatnot, and he had this crazy dream, and he told them, you must tell me my dream. I'm not telling you what my dream was, but you got to tell me my dream. And then, not only that, you need to correctly interpret my dream for me. Now, any human being living today, if I walk, even my own wife, I said, Sydney, I had a dream last night. I need you to tell me what my dream was, and then tell me what it means. Even my closest person in my life would have no idea what happened in my mind. Because dreams are crazy. Anything could happen in a dream. So, no, here's the kicker. If you don't tell me what happened and you don't tell me the interpretation, you're all going to die. Mm. Oh. So that's a pretty impossible predicament to be in. Now, the good news is that this was set up so that Daniel could provide God's interpretation. God said, He said, I can't do it, but God will reveal it through me. So let's go ahead and read Daniel chapter 2. And that's the story you want to set up is say, so Daniel prays, God gives him the interpretation, he tells him the dream. Now we're going to read him explaining it to King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel 2, verse 31. And Daniel's talking to Nebuchadnezzar, and he says, Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms, chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. <clears throat> Come on, Nelson. It's good, bro. Come on, bro. Get that one. Nice. Cool. Verse 37. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, the third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything, and as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom, yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw that the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united, any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it itself will will endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Amen? Amen. Amen. Alright, so, when I read this passage, I like to break it down into two distinct parts. First, the story itself. The dream itself, and then the interpretation of the dream. If you try to explain it all at once, there's a lot of details for someone to remember, and it makes it a little complicated. So we go back up in verse 31. He says, Your majesty looked, and this is he's explaining what's happening in the dream here, saying, You you looked, and there before you was this large statue, this awesome statue. The head of the statue is made of gold. Right? So imagine a statue with a big head made of gold. Its chest and its arms 
made out of silver, its belly and its thighs made out of bronze. So gold, silver, bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. So imagine this, de descending order, gold, silver, bronze, iron, then iron mixed with clay, this giant statue, it's pretty awesome. And you're just watching the statue and all of a sudden a rock cut out not by human hands, so if it's not by human hands, who did it? God. God, right? <laughs> not by human hands, a rock was cut out and it struck the statue on the feet and the iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. Now, do you guys know what chaff on the threshing floor is? No. This helps you understand and visualize what's going on. Chaff, you got to remember that back then they were very familiar with wheat and chaff. Wheat is what you use to make bread. The chaff is the part, when you have a head of grain, right? The chaff is the part that you have to kind of get through to get to the little head of wheat that you actually make the bread with. You don't just take the head of grain and smash it all up. There's like kind of this, this grassy part. That's chaff. Because when you, when you separate it out, the wind can just easily blow it away. It's like it just kind of flat, floats away in the wind and disappears forever. So chaff on a threshing floor is like when you're harvesting, all this chaff just kind of blows away because you're separating the chaff from the wheat. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so chaff on the threshing floor, that's what happened to the statue. So boom, all of those, those pieces, those gold, turn into tiny dust and just blew away in the wind. But this rock that struck the feet, it says, became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. That's a pretty powerful dream right there. Now we can kind of remember from Isaiah 2, what does a mountain symbolize? Kingdom. Kingdom. Right, so you're trying to help people have continuity with what they're learning from the scriptures. Okay, so God cuts out this mountain and it fills the whole earth. Now, we will interpret it, verse 36. So by this point, it should be very clear what just happened in the dream. Does anyone have any questions about that? Pretty straightforward, right? Now, we're going to interpret it. He says, you, O majesty, are the king of kings. He kind of butters him up for a little while here. And then, at the end, he says, of, of verse 38, he says, you are that head of gold. So King Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold. He's like at the top of this whole statue. And then he says, after you, another kingdom will arise. So what, just by that sentence right there, what do we know the metals represent? Kingdom. Different kingdoms, right? Because he says, you're the head of gold, and he's not just talking about him as an individual, but his whole kingdom, because after you, another kingdom, so he's referring to a new kingdom, will arise. Inferior to yours. You know what the word inferior means? Yes. Below. That means not as good as. Mm -hmm. Just in the same way, that silver is inferior to gold, yep. right? And he says, next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. So we can imagine gold, silver, chest and arms, right? Then bronze, belly and thighs of bronze, and it's going to rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom. So, so let's talk about this kingdom of bronze right quick. So... What we see in history is the Babylonian Empire is the kingdom of gold, right? Yeah. Then he says, after you, a kingdom inferior to yours will come. Even in the book of Daniel, we see that happen. Nebuchadnezzar gets replaced. The Medo-Persian Empire steps in. Then after the Medo-Persian Empire, and you can actually look this up historically, which is pretty awesome, this kingdom of bronze ruled over the whole earth. Now that kingdom represents <clears throat> Alexander the Great. What's pretty interesting about Alexander the Great is that some of his armies even had bronze attire. And his army, he was known for conquering. Alexander the Great is known for conquering. That's why he says he will rule over the whole earth. Then, after Alexander the Great says in verse 40, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. After Alexander the Great came what's known as the Roman Empire. Yep. Right? The Roman Empire.
The Roman Empire, I mean, we could do seminars on the Roman Empire. It's pretty awesome stuff. But what you know from the scripture is that it's going to be one that's really strong and it breaks and smashes everything else. The Roman Empire pretty much came in and conquered everything and was in charge of everything. Now, as that kingdom got bigger and bigger and bigger, what happened is the people inside it became like clay mixed with iron. That's why it says iron and then iron mixed with clay. Does anyone know iron mixed with clay? Like literally, like why that's a weird thing. Because iron, when you smelt it down and you refine it really hot, is very strong. But if clay, you try to smelt that down, it's a different metal, it's a different element than iron. You try to mix it, the iron doesn't stay as strong as it would be. Like if you're trying to melt it and you put iron and clay together, that metal gets really brittle because the clay makes it not as strong as it was before. So they would, they would kind of understand this because they were used to melting down metals and that kind of thing. So if you had iron and you just put a bunch of clay in there, it's like you kind of ruined it. It's strong, but it's not as strong as it should be. Now it says that because the people are divided. It says in verse 43, Just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. Now as the Roman Empire expanded... They, were, they, they conquered so many people that there were so many people to govern that all these different peoples were disunified about what was going on. Mm. And as it got bigger and bigger, there's more and more people to take charge of. The, the, the kingdom couldn't remain united. Now, it says in verse 44, and this is the part that we really want to hone in on here. You don't need to be a, 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 a historical whiz to be able to teach this study effectively. Just some key details that we know from history today match up to what was written in the Bible 550 years before Jesus, right? Wow. Then it came true. So, in verse 44, in the time of those kings, the God of, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it itself will endure forever. Now, imagine reading that scripture in the time of those kings, God will set up this eternal kingdom that will be set up forever and no one else will rule over it. That's a pretty powerful imagery, right? Yeah. So now imagine you grew up around Jesus' time and you're a Jew and you know the scriptures, you know Isaiah, right? You know Isaiah, you know the prophets, well in the last days something's going to happen in Jerusalem. All nations are going to be there, right? You know some of these teachings. And then you know Daniel chapter 2, because that, that was another scripture written, 550 B.C. And you know that there's this prophecy that God's going to set up an eternal kingdom that's going to fill the whole earth, right? And it's in the time of the kings of, after this kingdom, boom, boom, boom. They just witnessed in history what had happened. They saw Nebuchadnezzar. They saw the Medo-Persian Empire. They saw Alexander the Great. They know their history from the recent history. And they saw the Roman Empire rise up, conquer everything, and they see how disunified people are. They're looking at their current time and saying, wow, God's going to do something soon. Mm -hmm. God's kingdom is going get to get set up soon. And we know it's supposed to happen because it says in the time of those kings it will happen. So we know, okay, so when is the kingdom supposed to come? Well, after all these other kingdoms kind of rise and fall, it's supposed to be around that last kingdom's time frame, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to remember that this rock is God's kingdom. It's cut out not by human hands. And it fills the whole earth. And it's a kingdom that's never going to be destroyed. Well, that's Old Testament predictions. Let's see what happens in the New Testament. Come on, bro. Cool. <clears throat> awesome. You guys with me? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Come on. Come on, I want you guys to be able to teach this like it's the back of your hand because it's so cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's look at Matthew chapter 3. Cool. Now, the traditional date... Of, of Matthew 3, when John the Baptist is preaching, is about 25 A.D. So we're going to start in the New Testament, towards the beginning, when John the Baptist shows up on the scene. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. Now, again, put yourself in the place of a Jew in the first century, before John the Baptist starts preaching, and what's your current situation like? You remember back a thousand years ago when King David was king? 
things were great. Everyone looked up to the Israelites. And over time, what happened? They got exiled. They came back. They did this and that. And what's their current situation? Now they're under the rule of the Roman government. Mm. And in fact, people from within the Jewish nation are now being paid to collect money from their brothers to give it to Rome as this overseeing country. Mm. It'd be like if, if, if a different country invaded here, took charge of us, and then some of us started taking money from each other to give to the country that just took over us. Mm. That's the kind of situation you got to realize is happening. So imagine being a Jew and you know these scriptures. Man, the kingdom. God's kingdom. God's Messiah is going to come. It's going to set something up. going to set everything straight for us. We're going to be back on top again. And it's going to be a kingdom that's never destroyed. Yeah. That's pretty exciting, right? Yeah. Now imagine that. You know that. You're learning. And then all of a sudden, Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. Let's go, bro. Come on. Come on. It says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying... Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Wow. This guy shows up, and he's preaching radically in the desert, quoting scripture, saying, the kingdom of heaven has come near. That should open your eyes a little bit to just how radical of a message that was for people in that time. It says in verse 3, This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of the one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight pass for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. Oh boy. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. I mean, if you heard that there was some crazy guy preaching at Lewis Beach, <laughs> would you go all that way just to hear him preach? Probably not. So you got to think, why were people going out to him from everywhere? He wasn't doing any miracles, mm. but his message was important. Mm. And he was a radical guy. I mean, he was wearing camel hair, and he was eating locusts with wild honey. I don't know about you guys, but I've never <laughs> tried to get wild honey from anywhere. Because you know what honey means? There's bees. <laughs> and I'm allergic to bees, so I would never. Yeah. But this guy was preaching the word, <laughs> saying, The kingdom of heaven is near. Repent. So people wanted to turn to God. They wanted to get ready for the coming kingdom. Well, let's see what Jesus says. Well, here's a question I like to ask. So if John the Baptist says the kingdom is near, is it here yet? No. no. It's not here yet. It's near. Some versions say it's at hand, right? <laughs> that means it's not here yet. Let's look at Matthew chapter 4. Let's go. And now if you, if you set up the first two passages really excitedly, now it's going to be like, well, show me more. When did this come? When did this happen? Rather than, okay, let me just get you through a laundry list of scriptures and then challenge you to come to church. Yeah. Right? We want someone to understand why this is so important. This kingdom is absolute, the, the, this, this study, the coming of the kingdom is absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. Matthew 4, verse 17. Now this is about five years after John the Baptist. John the Baptist was about 25 A.D., Jesus Christ came, the traditional date's around 30 A.D. He started his ministry, and by 33 A.D. he was crucified after three years of doing his ministry. But 30 A.D., this is where Jesus starts his ministry. Matthew 4, verse 17. He says, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Interesting. He's saying exactly what John is saying. So is it here yet? It's not here yet. Okay, well, let's find out when is this going to come. It's going to be around the time of the Roman Empire, so when during that time? Let's look at Mark chapter 9. Come on, let's go. Mark chapter 9, go. verse 1. Come on. Mark 9, verse 1. We're taking a trip. We're taking a journey. Come on. Yeah. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Yeah. Okay, so there's two different points here with this one verse. The first one is that the kingdom is going to come in the lifetime of some of the disciples. So those who are physically, literally standing there, he said the kingdom is going to come, some of you 
who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come. So it's going to happen in the lifetime of those disciples. So we know that puts a time limit on how, when the kingdom can come. Because all these guys had died within that first century, right? Yeah. So, okay, so it had to come in the lifetime. That matches up with Daniel 2. Mm. In the time of those kings, right? So we're kind of narrowing it down. When does the kingdom come? But it's not going to come kind of nonchalantly like, oh, hey, guys, oh, yeah, there's a kingdom. Cool. <laughs> no, it's going to be powerful. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. kingdom of God is going to come with power. Amen. you got to preach this with enthusiasm. The kingdom is so important. Mm -hmm. Let's look at John chapter 3. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Come on, Nelson. The point of the power is that you can make no mistake when the kingdom is coming. Mm -hmm. Because it's going to come with power. Power. John 3, verse 1. Hello, Nelson. John chapter 3, verse 1. Come on, bro. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. So you have this guy, a Pharisee. Now, good question. Do you guys know who the Pharisees were? They, they were the religious leaders during Jesus' day. Them, the Pharisees, along with the Sadducees, the teachers of the law. And they weren't just like church leader guys. They were the religious and political leaders at the same time. It was kind of like politics wrapped up into the religion, right? So, the Pharisee named Nicodemus, he was a member of the Jewish rulers, and he came to Jesus at night. So, Nicodemus at night is also known as Nick at night. <laughs> he came to Jesus at night and he says well God, we know you're from God you're doing all these miracles and you know what's funny Jesus replies directly with you won't see the kingdom unless you're born again mm. so we can kind of deduce that if Jesus responds that way it's because Nicodemus is kind of searching like what is this message what are you doing how do I be part of this kingdom I know it's coming we know the scriptures Jesus says you won't be able to see it unless you're born again. And Nicodemus is a little dull right there. And he asks literally, and I'm, I'm grateful that he says this literally because it helps us understand that it's not a physical birth. But he says, how can someone be born when they're old? They cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Very literal. And Jesus says, you can't enter the kingdom of God unless you're born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You shouldn't be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. So, it's, uh, it's important to explain at this point, that to enter into God's kingdom, because remember one of the questions at the beginning of the study was, when does the kingdom come, and how do I enter it? Well, you have to show someone, you must be born again to enter into God's kingdom. You see that right here, right? You have to be born again to enter into God's kingdom. This is not a decision that you make when you're one year old. You have no idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. This is not something you do when you're a child. In fact, Jesus explains you have to be born again, which means it's a decision you make as an adult, mm -hmm. with an adult understanding that you're going to be born again. And when he says you must be born of water and the Spirit, what do you guys think that means? Well, we know the answer to that, but that's a question I like to ask. What do you think that means? Water and spirit. What do you think that means? Just kind of see what they're thinking. And if they say, well, I think it's talking about baptism. You say, well, we'll see. <laughs> leave, them a, leave them a little cliffhanger right there. <laughs> well, we'll see what the scripture says, but that's a pretty good guess. But you've got to enter by a new birth into God's kingdom. Let's look at Luke 17. Let's go to 
Luke 17, verse 20. Luke 17, verse 20. Now, I like to continue to remind people, hey, remember at this time, people thought that the kingdom being restored would be like King David's coming back and placed on the throne, and they would be rulers over every other nation again. Mm. And in Luke 17, verse 20, it says, Once, on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come... See, they literally asked him, Jesus, when is the kingdom going to come? He replies, the coming of the kingdom is, of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst, or it also says it's within you. Now, the way to explain this is that remember what they're expecting is a physical kingdom. In fact, there's another passage where it says they tried to take Jesus and make him king by force. That's another passage that's not in the study. But, he's explaining that it's not going to be a carefully observed thing, like, oh, here's the perimeter of the kingdom, here's the people inside the kingdom, there's the walls, there's the king, and here it is, because it's not going to be like that. Rather, it's going to be within you. It's going to be in your midst. What does that mean? It's a spiritual kingdom. And he was laying that out. It's a spiritual kingdom that people are going to be part of. Of course, this goes over their heads. They don't understand this. But they will. Let's look at Matthew 16. Come on, Come on. Come on Nelson. Matthew 16. Remember, the point of this study is to help someone realize the, the importance of of how is this supposed to be applied to me today. Mm -hmm. And each scripture, you're setting a foundation for what does it mean for you to be part of the kingdom today. Mm -hmm. How do I enter the kingdom? What must I do to be part of God's kingdom? Matthew 16, verse 13. Matthew 16, verse 13. It says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, Who do the people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Wow. So this passage here is shrouded in mystery and confusion by the religious world. But we as disciples have to understand this like the back of our hand. So first, Jesus says, Who do people say that I am? And they're saying, Well, some people think you're John the Baptist. Some people think it's Elijah come back. But he says, but what about you guys? What about you guys, my inner circle here? Who do you think that I am? And Peter, well, his name is Simon, but it calls him Peter. Simon Peter. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. So Simon Peter understands and responds with actually what is known as the good confession. Which is what? Jesus is Lord. Mm -hmm. Simon preaches, Jesus is Lord. And to Jesus, he responds, yeah, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. Jesus is Lord. And because he understood that, Jesus says, this wasn't revealed to you by man, but rather, God in heaven revealed this to you. And because you understood that foundational truth, that Jesus is Lord, I'm giving you the nickname Peter. What does Peter mean? It means rock in the Greek. So he gives him this nickname. Hey, you're Peter, all a.k.a. Rocky, son of John, son of Jonah, Rocky Johnson, okay? <laughs> you are Rocky, and on this rock, I will build my church. So he's not telling him, hey, you're Rocky, and on this rock. He didn't start referring to him halfway through the sentence as an object. He's talking to Peter here. He says, you're Rocky, 
And on this rock, what, what rock? The one that you just discovered, mm -hmm. I will build my church. Mm -hmm. You guys with me? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. So, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And this church, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. We see in this passage that now Rocky, the guy who understood the truth, he says, here you go. <laughs> the keys of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Peter is receiving the keys of the kingdom. We also know that the truth that Jesus is the Christ is the foundation of God's church because in 1 Corinthians 3.11, it says no other foundation other than Jesus Christ can be laid, right? Mm -hmm. So we remember, we put the scriptures two and two together, we know that Peter is not the foundation of the, tr the church. Yeah. He's just a man. And in fact, in Acts chapter 10, he tells that to people. Yeah. We're going to talk about that in the baptism of the Holy Spirit study, but he says, stand up, I'm just a man. Many religious people today, specifically Catholics, teach that Peter was the first pope, and here's the reason. Believing that the pope priesthood has passed down from generation to generation, even to the pope we have today, who is currently deliberating and saying that priests should bless same-sex marriages. I'm not making this up, guys. So, what do we have to do? We've got to know the Word of God and what it really teaches here. Mm -hmm. Peter has the keys of the kingdom. So, the church and the kingdom is the same thing, built on the truth that Jesus is Lord. That's really important. Who has the keys? It's going to come in handy later. Remember that. Peter. Rocky <coughs> Johnson. Rocky Johnson. Peter. Let's look at Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, verse 50 to 51. <clears throat> says, Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man, who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Because remember, what are we trying to learn here? When did the kingdom come? Okay, well, by this time, maybe they're smart and they've kind of made some deductions here. Like, well, maybe the kingdom came with Jesus. Maybe when he died on the cross. Okay, but this guy, Joseph, he was a member of the council as well, kind of like Nicodemus. And it says he didn't consent to their decision and action, which was to crucify Jesus, right? It says he was waiting for the kingdom of God. So even after Jesus had died... The kingdom hadn't come yet. Okay, so when? we got to find out. Let's look at Luke 24. Yeah, bro. Let's, let's go. go. Come on. we got to look at Luke 24. This is after Jesus rises from the dead, and he's about to return back to heaven, but he tells this to his disciples in Luke 24, verse 44. Luke 24, 44. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. Isn't that pretty awesome? Mm -hmm. The Old Testament Scriptures, the Law of Moses, that's like the Torah, right? The first five books of the Bible. Mm -hmm. The Prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and the Psalms, written by David himself, right? All these things, written over hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years, must be fulfilled. That is written about him. So this is a big deal. Verse 45, then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Don't you just wish Jesus would do that once in a while? Yeah. Sometimes we're struggling, we're like, Jesus, what's going on in my life? Well, Jesus opened their minds wow. so they could truly understand it. He told them, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in His name to all nations. Hey, does that sound familiar right there? All nations? Beginning at where? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Interesting. So what's going to be preached to all nations in Jerusalem? Repentance, forgiveness of sins. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Wow, that's pretty awesome right there. 
So this is a prophecy Jesus gives them of something that will happen. Now, depending on the person you're studying the Bible with, sometimes people who have like a Pentecostal or apostolic background need a little bit of massaging over and over again what the scriptures teach right here. So one thing I like to kind of point out, even if it's not relevant for this study, say, what is it that Jesus commanded them to do? He commanded them to stay in the city. That's all they did. That's all they did. That's what he commanded them to do, right? That's just a, a note to take note of. What did he command them to do? He didn't command them to do anything else other than stay in the city. Let's look at how this all comes together in Acts chapter 1. Let's right. go. The puzzle is going to be put together by the end of these two chapters. Okay. It's pretty awesome. Acts chapter 1. Verse 1. Now it's important to remember, the book of Luke starts off with the same name, Theophilus. It says in my, in my book, Theophilus. That's a title that means friend of God. You don't have to go into all this detail when you're teaching it to someone. The point is, though, the book of Luke ends in Luke 24, what we just read, and it begins again in Acts chapter 1 because it's the same author, Luke. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's Acts, we just read it. Now... I mean Luke, and now it's Acts, right? So Acts chapter 1, it's kind of like part 2, Luke part 2. Verse 1, in my, book, in my former book, Theophilus, say that five times fast. <laughs> I, <laughs> I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about grace. What? Oh, no. What? what? Wait, wait. What did he speak about for 40 days? If you're going to follow Jesus, this has to be an instrumental teaching in your, in your teachings. An instrumental, fundamental teaching. Because Jesus, after he rose from the dead, what did he spend 40 days talking to his disciples about? The kingdom of God. Now, I could preach the same sermon 40 times. By the second or third time, you guys are like, okay, guy, like Nelson, I get it. We reemphasize it. Now what? Let's do something new. No, the kingdom. We got 37 more times to go. <laughs> yep, th this lesson for the next year, 52 weeks in a year, every Sunday. Yep, kingdom. There we go. But Jesus spoke for 40 days straight about the kingdom of God. Awesome. On one occasion, verse 4, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Remember, here's a command. What did he tell them? Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. Well, what did he speak about for 40 days? The kingdom. Interesting, interesting. In verse 5, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? See, they were still a little off in their understanding. They were like waiting for Jesus to come and like establish his throne and like, you rose from the dead, you proved it, like now we're back on top again, right? Well, verse 7, he said to them, it's not for you to know. The times or dates the Father is set by His own authority. But you will receive power. Mm -hmm. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Mm -hmm. wow. wow, it's pretty powerful. And he said that after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said. I mean, imagine that. <laughs> Men of Galilee. Oh. <laughs> Why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So he kind of had to like snap him back into what Jesus commanded them to do. Go to the city and wait. So, Amen. Now it says in verse 12, Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. 
Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, amen, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter, who has the keys of the kingdom? Peter. Okay, interesting, interesting. He stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. It's pretty gnarly. The Bible is not G-rated right there. Whoa. Now... You might be wondering, well, didn't he hang himself? Well, yeah, he did, but the idea is that he hanged himself, and his body fell after being hanged for a while, and it just, you know. <laughs> I, I, that's what it says right there. <laughs> Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language, Akabama, which is field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it's necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us from the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us. Okay, so they're choosing someone to replace Judas's position as an apostle. What's the qualification of an apostle? Someone who had been with them from the beginning. So there's no living apostles today, guys. No matter what many of these false doctrines teach, there's no apostle in brown or apostle whatever. Right. Now, they end up choosing Matthias, and he was chosen and added to the eleven. Now, why is this important? Because remember Mark 9.1, some of you who are standing here won't taste death. So most of them didn't taste death, but who did? Judas. Judas. Right? Yep. All right, Acts chapter 2. Come on, bro. We're going to see how all this continues to fit together. Put it together, bro. We're in the home stretch here. The puzzle's coming together. It's clicking, right? And we're excited. What's going to happen next? Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Why? Jesus commanded them to wait in the city. What's Pentecost? Pentecost is 50, pente meaning 50, days after the Passover. If you know your Bible, Jesus was crucified on the Passover as the Passover lamb atoning for our sins. That's why his bones were not broken. They were not to break the bones of the Passover lamb either. A lot of cool stuff there. But 50 days after, remember how long did he speak in the desert talking to his guys? 40 days about the kingdom. So, he was killed on Passover, on the third day, on Sunday, rose from the dead, so that's three days, and then for 40 days, spoke to his disciples about the kingdom, about 43 days, right, and then about a week later is the 50th day. So, we can kind of do the math here and realize that this day was probably a Sunday. Pretty interesting, right? The first day of the week, Passover, uh, Pentecost. But Pentecost was the festival of the first fruits. It was a mandated festival for all the Jews to come together to celebrate. So, they were all together in one place on Pentecost. Suddenly, verse 2, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now imagine... All of a sudden, it's quiet, it's a nice, peaceful day, and all of a sudden, so deafeningly loud, the shutters are shaking, the wind is blowing through the house, and all of a sudden, fire. Tongues of fire. I don't know what a tongue of fire looks like, but came to rest on each one of them, and now, Jeffrey is speaking Hindi. Uh-oh. Oh. And, and my daddy is speaking Mandarin, and Jeffrey's like, what? How is he doing that? Wow. He's not from there. Smart. And I'm speaking Cantonese. Whoa. And, and wow. people are speaking all these different languages, because that's what the word tongue actually means. The literal word for tongue is language. Yeah. Any sort of people who believe that a tongue is like this, 
or whatever it sounds like, <laughs> need to be shown gently that this is in the scripture, that yes. it was never some made-up babble language. Yeah, that's facts, bro. Yeah. Why? Well, how do we know? How can you prove that to me? Well, look at verse 5. Now they were staying in Jerusalem. Hey, does that ring a bell, Jerusalem? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? Isaiah 2, Jerusalem. Yeah. Rings bell. They were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from <gasps> every nation. Mm. Every na All nations are going to stream. Okay, that's interesting. Check, check. From heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their, heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed. They asked, aren't all these men who are speaking from Delaware? <laughs> or Galileans? <laughs> then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and Commons, Judaism, Judaism, Cretans, and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues or languages. Wow. Patwa, yep. They heard that too, probably. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They've had too much wine. You know, no matter how seriously you can take it, someone will still criticize you. Oh, yeah. That's true. No matter how committed you are to God's kingdom, yeah. someone will still think that you're out of your mind, you're crazy, oh, yeah. it's a waste of time. You're just drunk. Mm -hmm. Then Rocky Johnson, Peter, verse 14, <laughs> stood up with the eleven. Now, who has the keys of the kingdom? Peter. Peter, right? Peter. He raised his voice and addressed the crowd. I think that's a miracle in itself that he by himself could speak to thousands of people and they were all quiet enough to listen. Oh, yeah. Sometimes in a room with just you guys, I have to speak over y'all. You know what I mean? Uh, that wasn't a diss at you. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. You got like, wow. And he addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days. Okay, that rings a bell right there. God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire, billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So one thing to realize here is there's a reason why he just quoted this whole passage, because what just happened was what was written right there. Wow. A lot of people misunderstand this. A lot of religious people say, yeah, the moon's going to turn, and, and who's who's, and the, and the blood, and the fire, and I'm serious. It's true, yeah. Well, why would he quote this? from Joel 2, which was written way before this, unless it was being fulfilled right here, right? Mm -hmm. Verse 22. Fellow Israelites, listen to me. Listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my tongue rejoices, my body will also rest in hope, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, you will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life, you will fill me with joy in your presence. Verse 29, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead. He's explaining what he just read here, guys. He's explaining what this prophecy was by David. Nor did his body see decay. Verse 32. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. 
For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, anytime the Bible says therefore, what is it therefore, therefore? Therefore. Therefore, because of all this stuff he just explained fulfilling, David's descendant being put on the throne, because remember, it was promised a thousand BC about that time, that one of David's descendants would, be, be, would become on the throne forever. Mm. That's a pretty important thing. At the beginning of the book of Matthew, it lists the lineage from David all the way to Jesus. Jesus is a descendant of King David. Mm. Yes. Awesome. Now, his father was God and his mother was Mary, but through the, the patriarchy, not the patriarchy, guys, the patriarchy, <laughs> okay, of, of, all, of the, all of the men... Jesus was a descendant of King David. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. So the guy that you're waiting for, that you couldn't wait to take over this kingdom, you know, you guys killed him. Sheesh. That would be pretty convicting, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, how could that be so convicting? They weren't even there. I wasn't even there. Well... What is it that put Jesus on the cross? Our it's our sin, right? So they were convicted. They were guilty of it. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Well, Peter replied, Repent and say a prayer. No. Wow, you know how complicated this is? It's really not. That's the point. <clears throat> Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for... The forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. This is powerful stuff right here. If you put all the scriptures together, remember, and I'm just going to kind of go through it. Isaiah 2, in the last days, the mountains, the kingdoms will get established, all nations will be there, it will start in Jerusalem. We see that fulfilled here. Daniel 2, after all these empires rise and fall, in the time of the Roman Empire, in the time of those kings, God will set up his eternal kingdom. Remember, it's the Romans who crucified Jesus. So it was in the time of those kings, right? Now, John the Baptist said, hey, the kingdom is near, which means it was coming shortly, but not here yet. Jesus started his ministry saying that. It's going to come in the lifetime of the disciples. Well, we know that the disciples were all here present, except for Judas, right? Mm -hmm. And what happened? It came with power. Boom. The Holy Spirit came without warning on all of them. They started speaking in other languages. That's pretty powerful mm -hmm. events. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the whole tongues of fire thing. I don't even know what that looked like. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we looked at Nicodemus who was told, you have to be born again of water and spirit to enter into God's kingdom. So when we place that with what is taught by Peter, who has the keys of the kingdom, what, is, what do keys do? Open. They open the door. So Peter's opening the kingdom to people for the first time because people can be born again of water and spirit, which is at your baptism. Mm -hmm. Amen. And we see that in Acts 2.38 because he says, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Baptized means to be fully immersed in water. Repentance means to totally transform. So you know that he's talking about being born again because to become a brand new person is a big transformation. Mm -hmm. And you get the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to continue that part of the study later on about the Holy Spirit and whatnot. And the different baptisms. But, how does someone enter the kingdom? they got to be born again of water and spirit. That's what Peter preached. Peter had the keys. He opened the kingdom. Another thing to remember. Jesus said, in Luke 24, what's going to be preached first in Jerusalem and then to all nations? Repentance and forgiveness of sins mm -hmm. will be preached. So what does Peter preach? Repent and be baptized for forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. yeah. Pretty succinct message here, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, the conclusion of all this, what does this mean? What's the whole point of the study? Well, when was the kingdom established? Well, we see 
around 33 AD, when, when Jesus, after he rose from the dead, about four, 50 days later, around that time, right? On Pentecost, okay? So if that's when the kingdom came, well, who can be part of it? Well, remember, in verse 39, Acts 2.39, Peter says, The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. So that's all of us, right? Mm -hmm. We're pretty far off. We're not the children of those who are there, and we weren't there. We're not their children, so we're all the ones who are far off. So the same message is true today. Mm -hmm. Why do we know this? Because remember, God's kingdom is going to get set up for eternity, and it will never be destroyed. Mm -hmm. That's what the prophecies teach. So we can be part of the exact kingdom that was established 2,000 years ago. Wow. Amen. Isn't that pretty awesome? Yeah. Yeah. That gives you a little more depth to understand when you ask someone, Hey, can you come to church? It's not about checking a box. You are the church, and you're either part of God's kingdom, heart and soul, or you're not. Mm -hmm. That's what the kingdom is. It's not checking like, hey, I made it to this meeting of the body, therefore I made it to church, therefore I'm part of it. You are the kingdom. Mm -hmm. you're, it's within you. Remember, that's what Jesus said. It's in your midst. It's a spiritual kingdom you're part of. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean? How, how do we make this study impactful? Well, I ask people, so how does someone enter the kingdom? Well... You gotta repent and be baptized. Yep. Have you done that before? Well, I was baptized when I was a little kid. Okay. Well, were you a disciple then? No. You know that repentance and becoming a disciple is kind of synonymous there. Because you're turning away, repenting, from your old life, and who are you turning to follow? Jesus. Jesus. That's the same thing as really becoming a disciple. To make Jesus Lord means to let go and forsake all my other ways, which is to repent. Jesus can't be Lord in my life. I can't say I'm a disciple if I'm not willing to repent. Mm -hmm. Very important. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, so if you've never really repented, but you were baptized, you're missing half the equation, right? you got to be a disciple. That's why the discipleship study is so important. You baptize someone who is a disciple, who's made the decision that they want to repent and follow Jesus. In this day, all these guys decided they were going to become disciples right then and there. They knew what the cost was to follow Jesus here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, when do you want to get baptized? Well, I need to be born again, right? As an adult, you've got to know what you're doing. So, what does Peter say you have to do if you want to be part of his kingdom? Repent and be baptized. Awesome. That's what the next couple studies are all about. Repentance, which is light and darkness, about sin, turning away from your sin. And baptism, which is the teaching of how to be born again in the light and darkness study, as well as in the church study, explaining what does it mean to be baptized into God's church. Amen? Amen. So, it should, by this study, if their heart is soft, they should already have a roadmap. When are you going to get baptized? What do yeah. we got to do to get there? And that comes with the intensity of you taking so seriously the study that after you teach it effectively, they're, camp, they're like, when can I get baptized? When can I do this? Okay, let's plan out your studies and let's shoot for this Sunday. Mm. That should be the heart you have. Now, oh, I kind of understand the kingdom. Well, I don't really want to repent, so I'm just going to hang around, you know? Or maybe I won't really make the decision to get baptized. But you can make that decision. They made that decision that day. If you accept this message, you need to get baptized. It's that simple. Now, what did it look like for them once they were part of the kingdom? Now, this is a good way to show a religious person what's it look like to really be part of the kingdom. Because most people who go to church on Sundays do not hang out with the disciples hang out with people at church. In fact, as soon as 1201 hits, it's the fastest moving old person I've ever seen. <laughs> Acts 2 verse 42. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayer. Wow. Am I devoted to these things? If I'm part of God's kingdom, I'm devoted to these things. Oh, well, I just, I, I couldn't make it to pray today. Well, I'm sorry that you don't want to be part of God's kingdom in your heart. Okay, breaking of bread and, and praying to the teaching, to the apostles' teaching, knowing the word of God. I want to be in there. I want to hear from what the apostles are teaching here. And it says in verse 43, Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Well, that's simply put. If Jesus is my everything and Jesus is your everything... We have everything in common. Uh -huh. 
And it says, every uh, in verse 45, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. And that's the kingdom of God right there. Come on, that's pretty awesome, right? Now this brings another part of the challenge is, hey, if you're really going to seek first God's kingdom in your life, now you realize why I'm asking you to come to church is because it's not just about coming to church. Mm -hmm. It's about being part of God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. When we get together on a Wednesday night, why do we get here early? Well, because Pastor Brown said so. No. <laughs> That's what everyone calls me these days. I don't know why. Not in our church, but everyone else outside. They're like, Pastor Brown. I don't call myself Pastor Brown. Yeah. No, we show up to church because it's not just a church. Yeah. This is God's kingdom. That's right. And we must treat it with reverence and awe. It says that in Hebrews. Yes. Since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, we must worship God with reverence and awe. Yes. Now, the challenge is Matthew 6, 33. This should be a challenge that they should be familiar with, which is to seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. So if you're putting God's kingdom first, what is your life going to look like? Well, just like what it says in Acts 2, 42. I'm reading the Bible. I want to know about His kingdom. I want to be part of His kingdom. I want to build His kingdom. Mm -hmm. Not my own kingdom. Right? I don't want to seek my own career, my own life, all these things. I'm building God's kingdom. That's why they were all together and they had everything in common. Because they had a common goal. To build God's kingdom on earth. Because whoever is bound on earth will be bound in heaven. And if you're not part of God's kingdom on earth, you're not in heaven. Yeah. Amen. So that's the kingdom study, guys. Yeah.